This program is brought to you in part by Sal Cal Real Estate Connections. Yes, welcome to Racing Action today. And today we have special guest, accomplished road racing vintage motorcycle racer, Bob Demetrius. And Bob, I'll tell you, you know, I cannot ex express how much I enjoy seeing what you do, number one. Thank no, you. Number two, how did you get involved in all this? Well, it's, that's a great story, uh, Larry. So I, uh, uh, it start, it, I've been uh, kind of a track rat. Uh, my dad was a hill climber and his friends road raced. And mm -hmm. so uh, he was bringing us to, I went to my first Loudoun National back in 1972 oh, when wow. I was eight years old, watching my dad's uh, friend road race. And so uh, it was a, pretty much a foregone conclusion at that point that I would end up doing this. Oh, wow. uh, so after I uh, got out of college, um, I decided I wanted to follow my brother, my older brother's footstep. He had he'd started racing a, a 500 Triumph Tiger uh, and, uh, the, in the club called the United States Classic Racing Association, or USCRA. Uh, and I followed his footsteps, and I had a BSA single, a 500 Victor, and that's what started my career. And that's where he started racing. Now, when you were a kid, were, were you like a mini bike kid or...? So uh, my dad got me, when I was six, uh, he got me a, it was a 67 or 8-ish, somewhere around there, a Suzuki 90 street bike. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was what he uh, let me run around the yard with it in the field. And he'd have to actually hold it because my feet wouldn't touch the ground. <laughs> and he'd get me going and then I'd kind of circle in. He'd run alongside me and get the bike when I would stop. Oh, wow, and, wow. Uh, when I turned eight, I got my first motorcycle, which was, I think, a 67 uh Taco 125 Alpina. And wow. So by that point, then, then I had, in my, my, in my world, I had a real motorcycle and uh, things were pretty cool. So you like, you used to go in the woods running around or? Yeah, yeah. So growing up, we did a lot of uh, trails and woods riding. Um, I, I, so my brother and I both, by the time we were 10, we were ice racing with my dad and his buddies in the winter. Ooh, wow. We stud up the tires and Now, where did you do that? In central Mass, a town called Brimfield in Wales. Wales, Mass was where the mm -hmm. Hall and Pond was where we did the ice racing. It wasn't sanctioned racing. It was just a bunch of folks getting together and, yep. and you know, having fun for, for a day. Wow. Now, you mentioned uh, USCRA, and, of course, you raced with AHMA, too, right? Yes, I so, M H R A M A. Yes, yes, A H R M A Arma. Yeah, so I raced with a couple of I've raced with I raced with uh, in the United States with the vintage and modern racing with the USCRA and with Arma A H R M A, mm -hmm. and uh, and I've done some racing with uh, modern racing with uh, the North the, the New Hampshire organization called used to be called L R R S. It's now Nemar N E M M R, uh, and also uh, for a short bit I did a little bit of A M A racing. Uh, but that oh, was wow. just, just very, very short, brief period. You mean like flat track? Or... I do flat track, but that was actually road racing. You're but I do kidding. Flat track you well, do yeah. flat track? I do, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That always, is, I'm telling you, that just, I just couldn't believe how they do this. Yeah. You know? Flat tracking is, is a phenomenal sport. And, uh, but the, uh, but the, the USCRA is a great organization. It's a, and so if anyone has ever, ever been interested in wanting to race a motorcycle or even just go and watch great motorcycle racing, um, it was founded by a gentleman named Bob Coy in the, uh, in the early 80s. It is the oldest uh, vintage racing organization in the country. Oh, wow. And uh, it's a great family of people. So you, you get all age groups. There's kids in their 20s up to folks like us in our 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and uh, it's, you'll find a, a, a great racing, but also a great community of people. I, I, I often tell uh, people in my work life that I don't know what I look forward to more, getting to the track to race or getting to the track well, to be with the, the I will there. attest to this. Starting out in this sport like we did, completely green, didn't know nothing about it, no matter who I talk to in that organization, including you, and Christine, and Henry Seifer, and Pete Talabach. I mean, no matter wh who I talk to, they would always help you. It was, yeah. And it feels just like a family, you know? Yeah. I can't say enough about it, really. Yeah, it, it really is a great organization. And, and ARMA is too. Um, I, love, I love the people and I love ARMA, but I started 
my racing with the USRA, and I think because I started there, I still have a soft spot in the uh -huh. heart for, for the USRA. It really is a great bunch of people, um, great racing, um, and great people. Well, I'll tell you, Bob, I've seen your both road race bikes, number 600. I believe we have pictures of them you know, you know, with you on the track, and they are beautiful bikes. Thank I you. have to. See. Now, what class do you run? Two different classes with so them. So I run three classes. So I have three bikes currently that I'm racing. One, the 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 one that I've had the longest. It's a Honda 350. It races in the vintage class, and I race in what's called the lightweight super vintage class. And then I generally will bump up to the next bigger displacement, the bigger bikes. That's mm -hmm. the the production middleweight class, Ooh. and depending, sometimes I'll bump up to the heavyweight super vintage, and that's mostly 750 bikes. Um, and depending on the, the the track, or if I feel like I have enough gumption left in me, I'll, I'll enter those races. That's my 350 Honda. Um, I have a an SV650 which I purchased a few years ago. It's it's my modern bike, mm -hmm. and so I run that in mostly modern racing and lightweight superbike. Wow. In the USRA, that's a, they have a class for that called Formula Twins. And then I have a another special bike. Um, it's been a long time building, but it's a it's a Yamaha uh, Factory Grand Prix 250. TZ 250 chassis, and it has a Honda 450 single motocross motor in it, Ooh, and, wow. and it's it's called a Super Mono. There used to be a uh, a lot of these, and and a gentleman by the name of Dale Quarterly uh, uh, worked with me and built it for me. Oh, Dale, I know. Yeah, he's a he's a famous race pretty guy. Pretty famous I'll guy. Yeah, down. number 32. So if anyone is interested, yeah. look up number 32 Dale Quarterly. Um, he is a superstar, former pro AMA racer, mm -hmm. still racing cars and trucks today. Uh, still brutally fast, a great guy, and uh, and he helped me sort that out and get the super mono. So I have those three Ooh, now. Wow, wow. So the the three fifty now is is that basically where you started? Or no, it is. Yeah, yeah. So so I raced that um, for a few years. I raced my my BSA B fifty. It was a it was a, a Victor five hundred single. It was just. It was a, a bike that my dad had in his garage, and so it was more or less clapped out and mm -hmm. uh, spent a lot of time repairing it, and uh, it was breaking, and it would spit me off and break me, and so oh, we finally got the, the 350 Honda. They're, they're durable, uh, they're, and, and, uh, and then I worked uh, starting in 1999, um, Pete Talabak, who's the founder of Mach 1 Racing, and I got together, and I said, you know, I wanted him to build me a, a real genuine pedigree race bike out of the 350 oh, oh, wow. and so I've had this long odyssey uh, it's been a great road a great friendship um, he's one of my dearest friends now and uh, and he's built what is arguably um, one of the fastest 350s in the country and he's probably in in the, the coldest place in the country <laughs> right Beckett Mass yeah. Beckett Mass yeah yeah, yeah. There, when it's sunny here it's snowy there but uh uh, but uh, he, a great place, and, and he is a phenomenally, phenomenally talented individual. Oh, I could uh, tell. I could, when just talking to him, he, he's special, let yeah. me tell you. Now, when you race in both organizations, is that the same class, or are they different? So they are arguably the same class. They generally will have different names because they're two different, but it's generally the same. Mm -hmm. And they go by, primarily by, engine displacement and sometimes by chassis or design and sometimes they'll 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 go by two stroke or four stroke so okay. they'll if you have a two stroke race bike you that they'll have sometimes separate classes for those and four stroke and sometimes they'll combine them it just it just depends on now when you race with them is that basically like in in new jersey so they have a national schedule they mm -hmm. they go all across the country and i have raced the entire national schedule so oh, I, you did i do i have a national championship oh, i have two my, you got oh my dear uh, I, I i i i decided in uh in 2007 pete and i decided uh, let's see if we could actually win a national championship. And so we did the Arma National Series. I went across the country. Um, I had a great battle, head-to-head -head battle, with uh, the two or three-time running national champ, Steve Brown, out of out of uh, oh, out wow. of uh, uh, New Mexico. And 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 so I not only won the championship, which was an amazing feat, but I actually became really close and really good friends with Steve Brown, who is my nemesis. And the two of us to this day still stay in touch. And, and wow. uh, I, I had no idea that you, I mean, th that's phenomenal. Bob. Yeah. I, 
The, I, I can't even envision somebody doing something like this. The final race that year, it, it was a real dogfight. And, and so he would race a lot of the West Coast races that I wasn't at. And conversely, I would race the East Coast races. But then mid, mid country and a few of the off a uh, few of the West Coast races, we we would lock heads and, and it would be a dogfight between the two of us and either he'd win or I'd win or he'd win or I'd win. And it came down to Barber in Alabama for the yeah, last race. Yeah. I had to win both races and he only had to win one. And uh, I won the Saturday race and uh, we literally broke a head stud. At the end of the race, I came into the pits and there was oil coming off the back of the motor and Pete looked and we noticed that we broke a head stud and we literally had to find a head stud and and fix the motor that night or we weren't going to be able to race on sunday and we oh my god we, we managed to find a head stud we got it rolling i went down and i talked to to uh to steve and he said and his daughter uh, uh was there and and his young daughter she she was she's quite the quite the little at any event uh he's i said you know i got one and he was like yep he goes but there's still one tomorrow and i said you know steve <laughs> i said i this has been the best racing I've had of my life. This year has been, and he said the same thing. He said, yep, because I told, I told my, my friends, win or lose this thing, this will be the best year I've ever raced. And uh, wow. we're still friends today. That's so. great, I'll tell you. Now, when you, you said Barber. Would you, how do you rate that Barber track? Do you think that's the, one of the best places in the country? In this country, Barber is uh, one of the top three maybe the top two maybe the top one track oh, in the country oh wow it's uh it's like Candyland for motorcycle enthusiasts yeah, so yeah. uh if anyone is ever it's always in october and uh 65 to seventy-five thousand spectators go, oh my dear it has more spectators than any of the modern Amer modern road racing uh has ever and done. there's there's a horrendous museum there too right yeah the barber museum so so mr barber who who built the track and founded things um he made this museum uh it's 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 breathtaking he has he has motorcycles that you haven't even heard of and some that you may have think you've heard of and he's got them and they're there <laughs> and wow. there's race motorcycles street motorcycles uh if and and cars there's some cars there as well and and if you have any interest and are a fan of anything two, three, or four wheeled, uh, you owe it to yourself to to make a trip to oh, Barber. Yeah. And we are definitely going to have to get there. Yeah. I I read about it all the time, and I said, "Gee, this place must be special." They have life size sculptures in the woods around the track, and you won't see them on the track. But when you do the track walk, you'll oh. see them. They have literally they have dragonflies that are as big as humans with leaded glass wings on rocks. And they have Indians, bronze oh, wow. cast Indians, looking out, and it, it's oh, it's it's an amazing place. I, I it you, and as much as I describe it, I'm not doing it justice. It's that it's oh, that cool. Oh, we are definitely going to have to get there. Yeah. Now I got to ask you some. Did you know Todd Henning? I did. Uh, I raced with Todd Henning and uh, know Todd Henning and and bought my uh, my first set of race pipes from uh, from Todd on my first generation 350. Had Todd's pipes, uh, and then. Uh, after I won the national championship, his son Ari uh, decided that he was going to go do a, do a national championship on Todd's 350, and and we sh we actually met up in in Virginia at VIR, oh, wow. and uh, and and Ari had kept his lap times private, mine were public, and uh, Friday night at the end of practice, I was coming out of the showers and bumped into Todd, and we were talking, and he said, he goes, yeah, he goes. Uh, he says, yeah, my son's nervous. He goes, he's not sure. He goes, you're ahead of him right now. <laughs> oh, and he, and uh, we had a great race and Ari did get me. He, he, he came in um, on, a, on a, it was a great move uh, uh, on the second to last turn on the last lap. And he came in underneath me and made me check up a little bit. And when, he, when I did that, he was on the gas and I had oh, to check wow. up. And so he got like a two bike jump on me and our lap times were so close. I, I couldn't close that distance in the two, one and a half, half of uh, one lap and a, and a half a straight left. So oh, wow. kudos wow. to him. He he made a smart move and got me. Now, how how do you rate Todd Henning? Tell me, was he one of the best? He still is. He is one of the best. Okay. So so Todd Henning uh, established the 350 Honda as the weapon of choice mm -hmm. and made it a, a, a an enviable and viable race bike. He did all the the development and the and and the research in his little garage down in, in the Cape. Um, he was just phenomenal what he did. And he, he is the winningest 
Daytona racer in history. I think he has Ooh, wow. uh, s- uh, 60 or 70 something, don't quote me on that, but I mean, he's the winningest racer in the history of Daytona for motorcycle racing. Ooh, wow. um, phenomenal guy, uh, great individual, great human being, um, pretty cool guy. Well, when I first started thinking about this, I started looking at history and his name keeps popping up. Yeah. Then I said, you know what? I got to talk to this, you know, the company. Of course, he had sold the company. But right, right. He was so, a special guy. I, I could see that. Yeah, he is. And he unfortunately had a real bad crash in, in California in Sears Point and, and ultimately ended up with, uh, if I remember it correctly, the diagnosis was shaken baby syndrome. So he, he, he smacked his head hard enough where oh. I, uh, his, he, he had to learn to walk and talk again all over. Um, and so it was a long road to re- for recovery for him. And, and he's... I would say the times that I've talked to him in the last few years, I think he's, I think he's back. Um, if not 100%, he's, he's in the top 10 percentile. But, um, yeah, it was a, it was a tough, tough thing for, for him and the yeah, family yeah. To, to endure. Yeah, I'm sure that that's terrible, you know. Yeah. Now, Ari, every time I turn around, he's doing something crazy. Or What's he doing now exactly? So he is, I believe, still a writer for Motorcyclist magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has figured out how to uh, monetize YouTube, and so he has has one one uh, motorcycle channel that he sold, uh, and he has another motorcycle channel. It's a um, if you just Google YouTube and Ari Henning, it, you'll come up with it. But he does these great uh, snippets, 15, 10 minute snippets on how to repair motorcycles, how to, how to adjust suspension, yeah. how to know if your tire, tr- you know, to look at your tires to figure if your tread is wearing, if you need to add more air or less air. He has, he has a really great oh, way wow. of teaching you a lot of, of fundamental things on how to, how to uh, look at, diagnose, and, and, and keep your motorcycle in So good. he's very active today. Yeah. Wow, yeah. That, that's special, I'll yeah. tell you. I just couldn't believe when I first started looking into this thing that Todd Henning just kept popping up, you know. Yeah, he's the man. Todd Henning is the guy. I have a, I have two things. There was a, there was a, an auction after he had crashed. Um, a, b- a bunch of folks got together and said we need to do something to get some money so they can help with his medical bills. And uh, Jerry Wood, uh, who's also a racer and his yeah, and yeah. started the Penguin Racing School, and he. Uh, volunteered and was the auctioneer and a bunch of people uh, donated stuff including that was it was at a Loudoun National and um, Rob Muzzy's Kawasaki team took Aaron Yates when he was riding for Kawasaki at the time oh, wow. took a takeoff took a rear takeoff uh, they glued a mirror into it Aaron signed it and that was when I actually bought that it was one of the pieces that I have I have oh, that, wow. that mirror but a lot of stuff went into the auction and I bought uh, a, a, no, a, a fairing, a nose cone fairing off of his, uh, it was his TD, uh, it was either his TD250 or his Yamaha RD400 that he was racing. Um, and, and I have that in my, in my garage as a, as, a, as a keepsake. And I had him sign one of my, uh, my, the front plates on my, on my Honda. Ooh, wow, and uh, wow. and I, I told Ari one time when we were chatting and I told him that I had that nose, the, the fairing off of his, uh, I think it's, it might have been his RD, but I said, you know, it's yours anytime you want it because it's his dad's. And I think that, you know, yeah, should yeah. he want it, it should go back well, to him. Well, that's nice, you know. Now, we got to, you're going to start the season in, in in Thompson, right? So the U.S. Have you ever been there? No, I've I've only been there once to watch cars. Uh, so mm-hmm. this will this will be exciting. It's it's in May. It's the first time for all of us for the USCRA. We'll be there um, on a Monday Tuesday, uh, Monday Tuesday. Uh, and so, uh, pretty exciting. Looking forward to it. And uh, wow, we'll take we'll take the Monday, and we've decided that it will be uh, a practice day, a full practice day. Um, and myself and Dave Evans are the instructors for the race school. So, um, another point: if anyone out there has ever thought about, hey, this would be a lot of fun. I, I'd like to try road racing. The USCRA is a great program. Uh, myself and Dave are the instructors. We have a school and we teach you all the fundamentals, all the basics of how to, uh, of what you need to know to get out and, and yeah. race and safely. That, and that would be a good place to start, let me tell you. It's a great place. Oh boy. I think it's a great track. There are a couple of areas where there, 
we're debating, we're just debating on how we want to make it safe. There's a couple places where there's Armco and, it, and, and a Jersey barrier, and that's not an issue for cars, but for all of us on motorcycles, that, that's a hard impact yeah, zone. Well, yeah, yeah. So we've got some solutions that, um, that we feel are safe and uh, we'll, we'll Pay test bales them. or something like that. So we're going we're gonna to chicane in front of them. So we're going to create cones to mm -hmm. create what's called a, a chicane or yes, a bus stop, yes, yeah. which, will, which will physically slow the motorcycles down. And we think that the best thing to do is we'll position a standing yellow flag in front of those two areas, yeah. which means you, you can't go at full pace and you can't pass. Yeah. And so well, that will just make that one area a safe area. Well, that sounds good, so, you know, yeah. And uh, you don't expect a lot of people there? You know, I hope so. Um, it's the first race of the year. And so uh, sometimes it can always be dodgy if it's rainy, you know, so, you know, Motorcycle racing, unlike NASCAR, you know, we race in the wet and the dry. Uh, but sometimes if it's raining, people will say, yeah, yeah, it's raining. I'm not so sure I want to go. But uh, yeah, well, but, I, I, I could. I, I, it, it would scare me that I'll tell you. But yeah, if you're used to it, I couldn't believe when I was talking with Henry Cipher. I mean. This guy, they used to run a bike in the snow even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Race, racing in the rain is, um, so some people don't like it. So you, you can't go as fast and as hard as you can racing in the dry, obviously. But what racing in the rain does do for you is it makes you a much better rider because you're finesse. You have to be much, much more smooth and, and finesse with the throttle and with the brake. Mm -hmm. You can't be you can't be abrupt and sudden like you can in the dry. Jerky, jerky. Yeah, you've got, jerky. Yeah, you you've got to very smooth. really be yeah like a like surgeon well. precision. And so ultimately, it will make you a better a better rider. Now the two bikes or three you have. Are they good in the rain, both of them? So the, the 350 is great. Um, I have always run Avon tires for the entire time I've run that bike. Um, Avon no longer makes uh, road race tires, motorcycle road race tires. And so I'm on the last, certainly to us, certainly to us in, in Mach 1, we're on the last set of known Avon tires. Oh, wow. And so we'll have to make the jump and we'll probably jump to the Continental, you know, which is... That's, a, that's the other question. How long should tires last? So it's a great question, Larry, and it, and it, and it, and the, and the, the answer is it depends. It depends on your bike, your riding style, um, and how hard you go. Mm -hmm. So on the Super Mono and on the SV, I run slicks. And, and, and if it's wet out, I put rain tires on. And they're like slicks, but with, with tread. Right. Uh, but on the 350, it runs a regular street type tire, a dot race tire. Oh, wow. And so I can get, for example, on the 350, I can get about 400 miles out of a set of tires before they start to fade away on me. Uh, on the on the on the SV, I can get um, about 200 to 215 miles on the front slick, and then it goes away. I have to put a new front slick on, and I can get. Now, it is that because of a heat cycle? It is. Yeah, it's heat cycle and wear. So so both tires and slicks will. You, they they wear away, they abrade away, yeah. um, and 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 tires are kind of like brownies is a term that I use. So when brownies first come out of the oven, they're all nice and gushy and smooth and chewy, and then and then if you put them back in the oven to heat them up again to get them, the outside gets a little hard, the inside stays squishy. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of what happens to tires. The outside gets harder and harder. Oh wow, because I know in general racing. The heat cycle, you know, they said, well, yeah, it's good for so many heat cycles. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so on on slicks, for example, we have uh, tire warmers, blankets, the electric blankets that go on the tires, and they get them up to operating temperature. So when you when you take the blankets off and you go out for your race or for your practice, your tires are at Ooh, race wow. temperature. And you can go as hard as you can go right from the get-go. So the slick is actually... No thread whatsoever. No thread, just a big gumball. Oh wow! And there, and so there's little holes on the slick, and that's kind of like a depth gauge. And you can look and you can monitor how much of that outside carcass you have, and mm. and get a general idea. But most r racers um, uh, take copious notes, and and so I I log all my mileage on all my bikes so that I kind of have a general reference of when I need to start thinking about uh, slick change. So sometimes I'll say, well my slicks are coming up to where they're going to be out of their heat cycle and sidebar that so rain so street tires dot street tires 
they start to tell you that they're getting tired. So when you're in a corner, they'll slip a little bit, they'll slide a little bit, they'll move a little bit. You could they, tell, you could tell. And they give that. you that. And slicks generally are not. Slicks generally are, I'm good and I'm not good. And so Ooh. you'll go into a corner and it's perfect. And then you'll head into the next corner and the front will just go away on you. Ooh, wow. So, um, So you have to be mindful of that. And that's why keeping track of your mileage and, and your riding style is important for slicks. And yeah, see, we had continental tires because that for some reason, I, that's what they said, that's what you use. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, they, they still make, uh, they make great tires. I've never used them, but um, Ari uh, is one of the folks that I've actually talked to about um, the Continentals. And he says, he says they're, they're as good as the Avons in the dry. They're not as good in the wet. The Avons were always the, the oh, best yeah, yeah. tire for the wet, which is why I ran oh, Wow, them. that makes sense, you know. But it's, that is certainly interesting. And so you're going to open up your season at Thompson. Yep. Are you going to do any Ironman races or no? Yeah, I will. So I actually was down in South Carolina three weeks ago. I opened up my 2024 race season at the Arma event down at uh, Carolina, Carolina Motorsports Park in Kershaw. Wow. Um, and it was uh, it was great outing. I won both of my uh, th classes on the 350. Oh, wow. Uh, so I was uh, it was good. I was I was actually. Uh, I was 33 seconds ahead of second place at the checkered flag. So. Oh, my dear. It was, it was quite a ways ahead. So. <laughs> well, Bob, when you're having fun, time flies. We're going to have to wrap up tonight's show, but I'm going to congratulate you. Thanks, I had Larry. no idea <laughs> the, the winning attitude you have. Thanks. Wow. Thanks. I am so impressed. Thank you very much. It's I been wanna, a pleasure. I want to thank you for being with us tonight, and thank you, and good night. program is brought to you in part by Just Results Weight Loss Center in Berlin, Connecticut. Water's warm at Jaws Pond, and we're stocked full of treasures. Big or small, we buy it all. We buy and sell fast rides, power tools, vintage guitars, and so much more. Walk the plank in style with our fine jewelry, diamonds, and watches. Plus, we have a huge selection of the latest video games, including the new PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. Jaws Pond, conveniently located on Meriden Waterbury Turnpike in Southington and West Main Street in New Britain. I'm your host, Kurt Barwis. Today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Andrew Lynn. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Veterans Corner. My name is Chuck Wooden. Decision for ourselves for this week, if we want to be made well. Hi, welcome to the crack of dawn. It's Dawn Lombardi. I'm starting the painting. It's going to be the clips with some water. Love it. He took me on the sets of Lost in Space, Batman. Everybody has a story. What's yours? Until next time.